On today's episode of Scientific Healing, you're going to hear... Anger gets labeled as a negative emotion because it feels negative. That's a hedonic feeling. And when you lay, and there are no negative emotions. Here is today's scientific healing tip. You know that in the crook of your hand, like right here, there is an important point that when you're feeling discomfort or emotional pain, you can press it. And the more you press it and the more painful it is in there, that means that there's a block. And you can just keep massaging that point and it will help release whatever is causing the pain. And I have a little tension in my back and I can feel it releasing now. So you can manipulate and change that um, all, all, you know, just change it as you're working it. So when you're sitting somewhere and um, you need to release things and I can feel that there's more tension in the right hand and manipulate and release it. So you just keep massaging it and I noticed that that tension that I was feeling a little bit in my upper back today is now uh, almost completely released. And you can even do a little experiment with yourself and ask you what pain level am I feeling or what tension level am I feeling? And it was about a three and now it's not even there. It's completely gone. Hello everyone, you're listening to Scientific Healing with Dr. Anastasia Chopoulos. I know the power of vibrational healing by combining physics and ancient healing arts to develop my own system that has amplified results with hundreds of my clients and healing students. When you're ready to feel energized at the end of the day after working with your coaching or healing clients all day while expanding and growing your practice, go to scientifichealer.com forward slash energize me or connect with me at scientifichealer.com forward slash appointment. So my next guest today is Dr. Ed Daube. His background includes a PhD in clinical psychology followed by a 32 year with a juvenile division of the California Department of Corrections as a psychologist, senior psychologist, supervisor and trainer. So you can imagine what kind of experience he brings to the table and I'm really excited to talk to him. He's also a senior adjunct professor of psychology at University of Laverne in Southern California. He is also the author of two best-selling books on Amazon on the subjects of emotions. So that's what we're going to talk about is emotions, something that's not that well understood by a great number of people. And so many people are really afraid of feeling anger or feeling um, depression or any kinds of those low energy emotions and think they always have to be happy, but that's not the case. And that's why I'm so happy to have Dr. Ed speak to us. So welcome to the show, Dr. Ed. I'm so happy you're here. Well, thank you, Anastasia. I'm really looking forward to the interview, and I'm glad to be here as well. Thanks for having me. Okay, so everyone has a really personal story on how they started down this path. So you told me earlier that you started out as pre-med, but you, instead you went to psychology. Could you tell us what, what prompted you to do that and a little bit about your experience? Yeah, what happened was I was pre-med at Berkeley, and I did all of my science courses, and I was also an economics major, so I was a double major, and I was covering my bases. And I basically got a D in organic chemistry, and I thought, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. And I took a job at a summer camp for exceptional children in upstate New York. Had no background in psychology at all. This was just a job that looked good. And I was put in charge of a, of a cabin and I had somebody who was a conduct disorder and probably ended up in prison. And I had somebody who was um, severely mentally, inca not incapacitated, but he had severe mental issues. And he was developmentally disabled, basically. They never should have been in the same cabin. But during that summer, the young woman I was interested in, because I wasn't married at the time, was in, uh, she was assigned to the autistic children. So I spent a lot of time with her, which meant I spent a lot of time with the autistic kids, really got interested in psychology, started asking the camp psychologist a number of questions, and I don't know where this guy got his PhD, maybe by mail order, but he didn't know what he was talking about, so he couldn't answer my questions. When I got back to Berkeley, I basically went to the psychology department, took on another major, and got accepted to graduate school, and it was where I should have been all along. 
because it was it fit perfectly with my personality and my interests. So I went to graduate school and my and I applied for a job with the Cali what's called the California Youth Authority, now the Department of Corrections Juvenile Division. And I was working with a number of young women, all of whom had severe histories of mental, physical, sexual abuse. And I just didn't know how to communicate with these folks. I knew what I knew, but I didn't know how to communicate that to them. My language was up here and theirs was down here. So I learned to communicate to them through metaphor. And I came up with the idea of emotions as tools. They had problems dealing with feelings. They either hurt themselves or they hurt others when they had feelings that they had trouble working with. So I came up with the idea of emotions as tools. Everybody knows tools. Back then it was a little different, but now people know their computers, they know their cell phones, they may know sewing machines, the remote control for their TV. <laughs> and I, they're all, when I have problems dealing with my remote control, I call my kids. But it, it isn't like I get mad at the remote control because it's just a tool. And emotions are the same way. I was training correctional staff. And these are folks who are in an authoritarian police model. And they have feelings of them either. So I couldn't talk to them directly about feelings or they'd say, that's that touchy feeling psychology stuff. I don't want to have anything to do with that. So I talked to them about tools. I said, you have to learn how to deal with your baton. Otherwise, you can't use it. You got to learn how to deal with, with tear gas or you can't use it. So you got to learn to deal with your feelings because if you don't, then your feelings will misuse you and you'll get in trouble with them. And so that's when I came up with the, the model, Emotions as Tools, wrote my book, and here we are. Wow, yes. Yeah. So, of course, there's a lot between when you started and here we are. <laughs> yes, an awful lot. So do you still practice? Do you still help people um, deal with them? Do you teach classes or? Well, yes and no. I'm a, a senior professor of psychology at Laverne, and I used to teach classes in personal growth, and which is a class I designed and, and other psychology classes. And now, because I've been retired for so many years, now I'm teaching philosophy, introductory philosophy, but I teach it basically as a course on critical thinking because it's so important for my students to be able to think critically. So yes, I still use the stuff and I have a blog where I write and, and teach about emotions and how to use emotions and I do podcasts. So basically, yes, I'm still teaching and I'm still helping, but I'm not doing it in a formal practice, excuse me, context. I'm retired my, and my wife wants me to be available to travel and be a husband. So <laughs> I fit it in. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky. My husband is still involved in my business, so we well, can travel together in the business. <laughs> so you have, you know, there's a typical pain point, And one of the things that we were talking about earlier was how people are afraid of being afraid or afraid of their anger or afraid of their, you know, like really their emotional reactions. And you, you had some really wise words to how to deal with those. So can you share that with our audience? Sure. The reason that most people do not like to feel emotions such as anger is because they don't understand that it's just a tool and because it doesn't feel good. Anger gets labeled as a negative emotion because it feels negative. That's a hedonic feeling. And, when you lay, and there are no negative emotions. All emotions, as I say, are just tools. They, are all, they all help us understand what's going on in our environment and prepare us to deal with that. So we get anger, we get angry, it doesn't feel good. We may then do things based on our anger. We may lash out at others, we may hurt others, or whatever it happens to be. And so we think, no, I should not get angry. Well, that's like saying, if I, if I take a hammer and I go to hammer in a nail and I hit my thumb, it's like saying, bad hammer, and I throw the hammer away. No, a hammer's a tool. I just need to know how to use it. So the, the so-called negative emotions, I should say that, that there are six primary emotions. There's mad, sad, glad, fear, disgust, and surprise. And we're all born with those emotions. We've got, all got them. The goal here is to understand how to use them to improve your life and your relationships. 
It isn't when we get angry to lash out at others. It's to say, okay, I'm angry, so I need to, and I should say that I'm talking about the anger, the anger mastery cycle. And your readers or your listeners can go to my website, theemotionsdoctor.com, and can download a copy of the anger mastery cycle. And there's no opt-in. They can do that. And what, what that says is, first we need to recognize that we're angry. We do that by knowing our body. Then we need to experience our anger and validate it. It's okay to be angry. Once you've done that, now we need to say, okay, we need to assess. What is the nature of the threat that I perceive? This is where you begin to use your anger as a tool. What is the nature of the threat? If there's a real threat, a boundary issue has been violated, a goal has been interrupted, you've been demeaned, you've been put down, there's a real threat, so now you use the energy of your anger in order to deal with the threat. If you decide there's no threat, then you let the anger go and you go back to your default state of happiness and calm. It all works together. But as I say, the problem is that if people don't understand their anger, they either get controlled or think they're controlled by their anger, or they want to deny the anger, and in both cases, they end up hurting themselves because they're not using the energy which they are naturally have to deal with threats that they're facing. Right, and and so a, a lot of us know that um, if we try to suppress the anger, what we do is we stuff it down in our bodies, and that energy, that like really strong energy that you feel during that anger, starts to wreak havoc on the inside. And I know that from personal experience because I did not even know how to express my anger because when I was little, I always got punished for getting angry. So I would hold it down yeah. and I swallowed it all. And then I ended up when I was 40, got really, really sick from swallowing all that anger. And that creates stress in the body. And we all know what stress does, right? High levels of cortisol and you know, you're off to the races with chronic diseases. Yes, and that's also where anger gets a bad name because people say, well, if I've got chronic anger, I'm going to have heart problems. Yes, but it's the anger that you hold in and you don't express and you don't use as a tool. And then it expresses itself in things like heart problems and all kinds of other things, as you pointed out. Yes. But anger, anger gets a bad name. And that's what I've tried to help people understand. Anxiety gets a bad name. We don't want to feel anxious. But the challenge with that is to understand what anxiety is. The message of anxiety is there may be a threat in the future and that threat may hurt me. Well, if I understand that now when I feel anxious, I can say again, what's the threat? I can, I can assess it cognitively using my frontal cortex. I can say, what's the nature of the threat? If there is no threat, then I can let it go. Or I can, as my students do, I can use my anxiety as eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -S -S, and use the energy to motivate me to study. Now, the other thing that people don't understand is the flip side of anxiety is anticipation. It's the same emotion. Anxiety is a future-based emotion that looks at a possible threat. Anticipation is a future-based emotion that says, wow, I'm really looking forward to that meeting. I'm really looking forward to that interview. It's the same emotion, but it's used differently. Right. And so, uh, you know, some of the ways like animal, when an animal is anxious, it'll start pacing to dissipate that excess energy that's on the body. So that is another way to deal with it. Like when I, when I had a, when I lived in Germany, I got a call from my mother and she really upset me one day. So I went out and I took the tool for digging up dandelions and I dug up all the dandelions in my yard. And by the time I was done, the anger was gone and my garden was clean. Can I, can I clear something up, Anastasia? Sure. What you, what you said was your mother upset you. Yes. In fact, your mother didn't upset you. Yeah, she pushed a button, right? Well, she pushed, she a pushed a button, but you chose to get upset. And the only exactly reason, right. But the only reason I correct you is because when you say, and people do, she upset me, she made me mad. You give away your personal power. Now I know that's not what you meant, 
No, it's not what I meant is I know. that at that moment, she said something that, that she would trigger, you know, I, it was like a trigger for me that if anybody said that to me, I would be upset. Yes. But, but that's many, because of my own feelings about myself. Exactly. But many people use the words, he made me mad, and they actually believe that somebody else controls them. Correct. But, and they can't. No. So they need to understand that that person did something that you chose to get upset about, and probably rightly so. Yes, but, and years later, she could say the same thing, and it never bothered me. Exactly. Because I grew up. Right, because the control is always in you. Mm -hmm. That's right, and I love that you made that distinction. Because it's just like a speech pattern, and we really have to watch our language. You know, we get caught in this, like all of us, I get caught in my own speech patterns, old speech patterns, and they're obsolete. Yeah, I, I do too. I can teach this stuff, and I wish I could say that I always used it, but I don't. I mean, I still get caught up in old habits, and I have to stop and correct myself, and it's all a learning experience and a growth experience. Right, and I try to remember, and I do most of the time, that when somebody is angry at me, that's, you know, it's none of my business. They have to figure out why they're angry. And the same thing as I'm, I'm angry at somebody else, I always ask myself the question, what is it in me that upsets me when I see that? You're listening to Scientific Healing with Dr. Anastasia Choplis. We'll return right after a short break. You can actually do simple physical manipulations on yourself to change your mental, emotional state, release blocks, and even um, release things like pain in your body. And of course, the backup to all of these techniques, the backup is to work out also the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, and then relieve the physical. Um, I have a process that does that. We go through um, one step at a time and clean up all of, so you didn't, whatever condition that you have, whether it's mental, emotional, spiritual, or physical, whatever condition that you have, especially if it manifested in the physical, was usually years in the making. You didn't get it overnight, years in the making. One of the ways that I work is I find out when something uh, got manifested in your body like go back to that year and then rewrite the story uncreate the story redo the story so it's as if it never happened it's as if, <clears throat> if you imagine your life is a tree and here you are at birth and each decision that you make will create a different branch right so you have all these branches of possibilities and you're ending up somewhere along the branch and by doing energy work, it's as if you did not make that decision and instead you made a different decision and you end up on another branch. So that's the way I view energy healing with regards to, to whatever your life is now. And the great thing is that we are infinite beings of light, powerful beings of light, and we can change our history and we can rewrite things and we can create whatever life we want. And I'm ready to have a conversation with you if that's what you'd like to have in your life. Either learn it for yourself or to um, have me help you with it. So I have my contact information is scientifichealer.com forward slash contact or scientifichealer.com forward slash appointment. So you can either write me or have a conversation with me and I always answer the you know I always answer whatever queries come through and I do it personally because I'm very interested in hearing out hearing what you would like to hear welcome back this is Dr. Anastasia Choplis on Scientific Healing Radio let's dive deeper into our conversation yes now in the context of a relationship when somebody is mad at you you can use their anger as a tool as well. And here's how you do that. If you're angry at me in the context of a relationship, I, and, and, and our relationship is important to, to me and to both of us. Now, I understand that it's your anger. But if I know that your anger is telling me that you perceive a threat, it's still your anger. But now I can say, what is it that's going on in the context of the relationship that leads you to see me as a threat? And now we can process that. 
That's how I use your anger as a tool to improve our relationship. Yep. You know, I'm always saying that too, right? That uh, when somebody is angry at me, it's like I am asking myself, what is it they're trying to tell me? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if I understand that, now we can process it. Right. And I, and sometimes, uh, you know, there have been times, especially when I was in the, the throes of a divorce and, you know, he would yell at me and I would say, and I would say, well, what is it you want? Mm -hmm. And over and over, I just keep asking, well, blah, blah, blah. And you did this and you did that. But, you know, what is it you want from me? Mm -hmm. And finally, the answer would be, I want you to pay some attention to me. Exactly. You know, but, but having, having that, you know, being an empath and having that amount of, of emotion thrown at you is not always easy. And there are ways to actually prevent it from hitting you and, you know, seeping into you. But we all, you know, what I was describing earlier is we know from, from scientific experiments that the heart emanates out emotions. And when somebody is really happy and they come in the room, you can feel the energy in the room goes up. And when they're really upset, especially if it's a boss that runs a company, uh-oh, the boss is coming and he's grumpy and everybody better go duck and hide. Um, you know, the mood of the whole place goes downhill and that's because you're feeling those things that are coming out. So we don't live in a vacuum and we are energetically designed all of the energy systems in the body, the nerves, the nervous system, the lymphatic system, you know, the energy field that's around us and all of our, our organs all are designed to connect with one another. You know, they're re it's really important. And by giving people a tool like you've given them, a tool to be able to manage their way through it and not be consumed by those emotions and release them in a healthy way is really, really important. So I'd, I'd like you to, you know, if you could offer somebody a few tips for how to get started with this, like they feel... I know that there are some people that have these, these anger cycles. They blow up, then they're contrite, then it builds up, then they blow up, then they're contrite, then it builds up. So there's like this, this cycle, cycle or rageaholics or something. So what would you offer a couple of tips to help them really get started and you know, dig in and really make headway in this? Well, the first thing I would say is to have our viewers ask themselves, are the emotions that I feel working for me to improve my life and my relationships? And if you've got somebody who's on that kind of cycle, the answer is most likely to be no. And it's most likely to be no because they're, they're getting angry, they're calming down, they're getting angry, their relationships probably are not lasting, and they're, they're probably feeling like they're an outsider or and they're alone. They feel guilty. Or they feel guilty. Yeah, okay. and ashamed. And so once they shrink down into that guilt and shame, it's really hard to get out of. Exactly. So that's the first thing, is to understand that, that it's not working. The next thing is to understand what their emotions are telling them. And that's the message of the emotion. Now, the message of anger is, um, I perceive a threat that I believe I can eliminate if I throw enough force at it. That is why an anger energizes us to go to war. Now, it doesn't mean there is a war, but we're energized to go to war. Now, I need to explain the difference between guilt and shame because they're not, it's not the same. Correct. The message of guilt is I have done something wrong. The message of shame is there's something wrong with me, which is why I tell parents, do not use shame with your kid. You're a bad girl or you're a bad boy because what the kid picks up is there's something wrong with me. As opposed to, I don't like what you did. What you did was wrong. So, now, in the emotion cycle is, if I understand what I'm feeling, I, I'm in touch with my body, so I know how my body tells me when I'm angry. I know how my body alerts me that I'm feeling guilty. I know how my body alerts me that I'm feeling shame. That's not easy to do, but it is doable. It may take some time. Once you're in touch with that emotion, then you have to go from the part of your brain, the emotional part, which is the amygdala, over which you have no control and you don't want it because you want to be able to react emotionally when it's important. But you go to your, your thinking part of your brain, which is the cerebral cortex. Now, it's your thoughts that will continue to energize the emotion that you feel. 
your thoughts about how you perceive an environment, a situation. So then the question becomes, okay, I'm feeling angry. What is the nature of the threat? And you don't need anybody else to do this with. You can do it on your own. Once you take it from the amygdala to your cortex, you're now beginning to learn to control your feelings rather than feel controlled by them. So you can ask the question, what's going on that I'm anxious about? What's going on that I'm angry about? And what do I need to do here in this situation to correct it? Now, it's easy for me to say this because I've done it for 32 years. But I want your, your viewers to understand they can learn to do this. The first step is to validate your feelings. Whatever you feel, it's okay for you to feel it. It may not be okay for you to act on it, but it's okay for you to feel it. Once you do that, your feelings no longer control you. They don't anyway, but you feel like they do. Right, and what, what uh, happens with a lot of people is if they get angry or upset or sad or any of those feelings, they'll go, ooh, I shouldn't be feeling that way. Exactly. And then they'll then they'll try to be phony happy, and then nothing is solvable. And the thing is that we were designed with these emotions for a reason. Yes. It's a very good survival technique. It's a way to protect yourself and your family. It's a way to protect you. Right. Right. And here, right. And here's the intervening step, Anastasia. Instead of saying I shouldn't feel this, they should say it's okay for me to feel it. Perfect. Now, now the next step is how am I going to act on it? Now they can say I need to choose the right action. I shouldn't go to battle if there's no war to fight. Maybe what I just need to do is I need to tell the other person I'm angry with them. Maybe that's all that's needed. So the step from it's okay for me to feel it to it may not be okay for me to act on it. And they need to choose the action they take. What this does is it instead of reacting to their emotion, which is what most people do, they are now responding to the emotion. Very different, much more adaptive. Right. And I know that there are there is a whole gamut of people all the way from people that calmly think about things. That's that was kind of my my style of it. And finally, acknowledging those emotions all the way to knee jerk reaction. But I from what I understand is that that entire spectrum of people is completely trainable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because you've had this experience with training troubled youth. Right. Right. Right, and, and they were used to acting out on their emotions. Mm -hmm. their, their formula was, I see, I feel, I act. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what I needed to help them understand is, no, I see, I feel, I think, then I choose to respond. Now, if a person isn't used to thinking things through, it's going to feel very foreign to them. It's going to feel, no, this isn't who I am. This isn't how I do things. Okay, I accept that. But if you want to change your relationships, you want to change your life and impact it for the better, it's something you can learn to do. It's not, I need to uh, assess, I need to get in, I need to analyze. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about simply asking the question, what is the threat and how best can I deal with it? Exactly. And once you ask that question, your brain will go into the mode of giving you the answer. Right. That's what's so beautiful about it. It's just once you ask a question for me, once I ask a question out loud, then all the answers come through. And I always say the quality of your life depends on the quality of the questions. Exactly. And, and even more than that, and this is, this is a, a technique, by the way, a secret that your listeners may be interested in having. If you're trying to solve a problem and you think about it and you think about it and you think about it and the solution to it is elusive, you just can't get it. Here's what you do. Before you go to sleep tonight, you ask yourself that question. And while you're sleeping, let your brain work on it. And the more you do that, you'll wake up in the next morning, and at some point you may be having breakfast, you may be driving to work, that answer will pop into your head. Why? Because what you've done is you've taken all that energy from forcing yourself to come up with a solution, you've released it all, and now you can let your brain come up with the answer, which it already knows anyway. 
Yes, because the subconscious takes everything in while the conscious only takes in 0.002%. Exactly. <laughs> right. So the subconscious knows everything, people. That's what meditation is all about. That's what, you know, what, what Dr. Ed just described is, you know, when you go to bed, just give your, give your subconscious a task. And when you wake up, it'll allow the answer to pop through into your conscious mind. So you have a lot more tools at your disposal than you thought. Yes, and I, and I learned that real quick. I, I When I was in graduate school, I had a roommate. We would get assigned a paper, and I would stay up all night doing it. He would stay up until about 1 in the morning and go to sleep. And about 5 in the morning, he would get up and type it. He'd been working on it all night and sleeping while I was just losing sleep struggling. Yes, I learned I learned your roommate's trick very early. <laughs> Go to bed early, it's way better, and then get up early and finish the job. <laughs> Absolutely, but it's, it's something that most people never learn because they just don't come in contact with it, and it's counterintuitive. Yes, yeah, so for people to connect with you is to go to theemotionsdoctor.com. No punctuation, no dash, no anything. It's just theemotionsdoctor.com. Yes, and, Emo emotions with an S, E M O T I O N S. Right, and they can you they can download uh, their or you have that uh, assessment there or that cycle to help people with yes. the first steps. So some awesome tips, and you have some books and a new one coming out, and I'm sure you've got them all connected on your website, right? No, no. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't gone to that point, but what I do have. This is the first book, Emotions as Tools. And if they go to my website, they can download the first two chapters of this book from the welcome post. And again, there's no opt-in. And my second book, which is Beyond Anger Management, and they can download the first two chapters of this as well. The books are available on Amazon. If they need to contact me because they have questions, they can go to my email, which is theemotionsdoctor at gmail.com. Beautiful. Now, the upcoming book is going to be on relationships, and the working title is The Interpersonal Prime Directive, and it's going, it, it will talk about the main rule that covers all relationships and how to enhance being able to relate to another person, and I'm working on it. Hopefully, it will be done by the end of the year. Oh, awesome. I'm really excited about that one, especially. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, your relationships are just so important for everybody. It's like the, the number one place that, that uh, really helps people's lives, their health, their happiness, their business, their income, everything. Well, let, 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 me, let me give your, I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah. I don't know how much time we have. Let me give, About a minute. <laughs> okay, let me give your viewers the prime directive. The prime directive is everybody is always doing the best they can in the situation given their skill set and their view of the world. If you understand that, if something's not working in a relationship, you need to look at the skills the person has in terms of relating to you or their model of the world, which is how they see what's going on. Yep, I learned that, that everybody is doing the best they know how. That's exactly correct. Because you never get into a marriage or relationship thinking, I'm going to trash it because I'm a jerk. Yes. And that eliminates blame as well. <laughs> yes. So, so we're going to wrap up. Thank you for listening to Scientific Healing and for our wonderful guest, Dr. Ed Daube. And you can connect with him at theemotionsdoctor.com. Let's you and I connect. Go to scientifichealer.com forward slash energize me to check out my certification program to help you thrive as a healer or coach while building out your practice. When you're ready to learn more, I invite you into a conversation right now. I have reserved time on my calendar for you at scientifichealer.com forward slash appointment. This is Dr. Anastasia Choplis. Until next time.